Hello and welcome to TV Talks, the show where I take a look at both the good and the bad of what television has to offer. Today, it's a little bit of a different one. I'm not going to actually review anything, I'm more just going to give a summary off the basic history of a certain series of shows. What shows are these? These would be the Steven Spielberg slash Tom Ruger Warner Brothers animated series from the 1990s. These were some of the most revolutionary cartoons that have ever come out. They helped make animation respected again. Not just for kids, but for adults as well. They raised the bar when it comes to television animation, because before this, there were things like Rubik, The Amazing Cube, or He-Man, The Masters of the Universe, which were just there to sell toys and teach very basic, ineffective morals. And of course, just about all of these, keep in mind I said just about, found immense fan bases, and even to this day, they're regarded as some of the most beloved shows of all time. Not even just animation. Of all kinds of shows. People of all ages still to this day adore most of these. And many voice actors who worked on them like Maurice LaMarche or Rob Paulson will say that these were some of the best projects they were ever a part of. Their impact cannot be understated, but I feel like I might be overstating. So let's get started with the first one, Tiny Toon Adventures. In the year 1989, a man named Tom Ruger went up to Steven Spielberg and pitched him a brand new idea for a Warner Brothers series. It would be a show about some new up-and-coming Looney Tunes stars that would have more than a little resemblance to their Looney Tunes counterparts, who would be striving to become the next Looney Tunes cast. Meanwhile, there would be mostly six-minute shorts packed in an episode, about three, sometimes two, with a couple vignettes in between, that would greatly resemble the classic Looney Tunes shorts of the day. Steven Spielberg immediately fell in love with the premise, and the two decided to work together to develop this new show, which was called Tiny Toon Adventures. So everything got off right there, right? Wrong. There were actually quite a lot of problems. The biggest one of all was casting. Word about this show and about the Mr. Steven Spielberg, who has at least a little bit of weight in Hollywood, spread far and wide. And over 600 people auditioned to be a part of the show. 600. Keep in mind, this show already has a fairly large cast for a regular series, especially an animated one. But even so, 600 people auditioning over the span of all these roles. Spielberg had the final say, of course, but Ruger was, let's just say, a little overwhelmed with this. And you know how high caliber people auditioned? Mel Blanc, the original voice actor for Bugs Bunny, among others, auditioned and got turned down. Granted, that was partially because he was very, very old and you could really hear it in his voice, but still, Mel Blanc getting turned down? Wow. And once it was cast, though, they felt like they had a very, very good cast that would help bring all these characters to life, and put new interesting spins on them that would help differentiate them from the original Looney Tunes characters and help give them their own edge. After that, it was on to getting the regular crew the people that would actually write and sometimes even storyboard and animate it. And they got a lot of people from Ralph Bakshi's cartoon, Mighty Mouse, The New Adventures. As of course, that one definitely helped lay the groundwork for animation becoming respected again, but this one really helped push it up. But anyways, they worked hard and long, but the first season was ready to come out and pretty quickly it became a huge hit, of course, with the press talking about it a lot because, you know, it's a Steven Spielberg produced children's show. This was unheard of at the time. But the 1990s audience loved it. They loved the fast pace, they loved the animation, they loved the characters, they loved the music, they loved, loved, loved the writing. And in no time at all, it was the network's biggest hit. With many critics and audiences pointing fingers at the writing, saying that it really helped bring the show together. Not just the character development, but the humor. The style of humor was of course very reminiscent of the original Looney Tunes cartoons, however, it had a little bit of a different edge. It did feel timeless, but you could also tell it was definitely contemporary that was written in the 90s, being that it didn't treat its audience like a bunch of morons, and actually had a lot of jokes in there that were not as kid-friendly. Stuff that, for the most part, got way past the censors. Their method of doing so was this. They would put one completely insane, outrageous joke into the script, along with a bunch of other pretty far out there ones. The censors would be appalled at the really, really far out there one, and then they would pitch a fit trying to keep it, but then would compromise saying, okay, we'll keep these jokes, but we can get rid of that really big one. And little did the censors know that was their plan the whole time, and it worked every 
single time. After the first season was produced, Spielberg and Ruger really took note of what people liked about it, and then for the follow-up seasons, decided to really expand on that, have more character development, have more songs, and even give some of the spotlight to some of the lesser appreciated characters. For instance, Montana Max, who off the record is my personal favorite, partially because he's voiced by the great Danny Cooksey, was actually given some starring hero roles as the show went down. Two to be specific. Granted, part of this was because young Danny Cooksey, who was about 14 at the time, complained that he was always the villain and he wanted to actually be a good guy, or at least morally ambiguous one for once. So he was given a couple of cartoons to really push his character forward, and that seemed to please both him and the audience. There was more continuity as the show went on too, of course, with the lingering will they won't they of Buster and Babs, although most people felt when will they was more applicable to describe it. The animation kept getting pushed bigger and bigger, and overall, the creators were listening to the fans and just giving them more stuff to love about it. But of course, the ones who loved it the most were the network executives. They greenlit them to have their own direct-to-video movie, Tiny Toons How I Spent My Vacation, being released direct-to-video, and of course, we all know this was coming, they turned to Spielberg and Ruger and said, Hey, Tiny Toon Adventures is such a big success, why don't you make another one? Not necessarily a spin-off, but why don't you do something similar? And so they made an obscure show called The Plucky Duck Show. Bet I got you there. Yeah, few people even know this exists, and technically it's not even really a show. Basically, they took Plucky, who was one of the more popular Tiny Toons characters, and gave him his own series with an asterisk. Only one of the 13 episodes was actually original to this, and even then, after the show got cancelled, they put it back into Tiny Toons. So this whole thing was kind of a waste. Everything else was just basically a plucky clip show. And audiences noticed that. Audiences in general hate clip show episodes, so imagine how they feel about a clip show show. They didn't really like it, and this show was quickly put to rest. However, the network was still willing to give them another shot, saying, all right, why don't you make at least something similar to it? And we'll give you a little bit more creative liberty. Now we get to the one everybody knows and loves, Animaniacs. Admittedly, the premise is fairly similar to Tiny Toons, although the characters don't necessarily have a connection with the actual Looney Tunes cast, save for in-universe Slappy Squirrel. The show comprises of a bunch of various casts, and each cast would rotate throughout the various weeks and episodes having various adventures and cartoons that were, of course, very similar in style of humor towards the original Looney Tunes cartoons, but with a lot of that Tiny Tunes edge, because they already had another show under their belts. So they knew what worked and what didn't. The character development, the music, the animation, and, of course, the writing and innuendos. So they knew to give them more and more of that. The show gained a lot of traction, even during its pre-production, even getting Broadway singer Bernadette Peters to become a part of the show as the character Rita. And as soon as it debuted, the show grew to extreme popularity, so much so that it actually ended up eclipsing Tiny Toon Adventures entirely. Tiny Toons was still popular, of course, but it was clear that people were more fascinated with Animaniacs. Maybe because it was newer, maybe because the writing resonated more with them, maybe they found it more outrageous. But the network had noticed this. Besides, they felt that Tiny Toon Adventures had served its purpose. So, Tiny Toons was put to rest after three seasons and Animaniacs became the network's golden boy. Or, can you call a series golden boy if it's... Nah, eh, never mind. Bad jokes aside, this show in the eyes of pretty much all of its viewers, did exactly what it was stated to do. Take what made Tiny Toons great and really, really accentuate it. As we all know, the writing in this is some of the most how did they get that past the censors in the history of television. Half of the things that come out of the Warner siblings' mouths would make any PC soccer mom scream. If there can be whole 20-minute compilations of just how insane a lot of these jokes and innuendos are, and they take up multiple volumes, you know that this show is definitely not for the young kids. Of course, though, they do it in a way where the little kids would have no idea what they're talking about, while the older ones would certainly be snickering, and of course thinking to themselves, I can't believe they just said that. 
But it wasn't just the innuendo that made this series special. No, 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 no. There was actually a lot more. The character development, of course, was very strong. Even though it was less plot-focused than Tiny Toon Adventures, the characters were still very strong and had really, really good dynamics. So much so, and they even tested this theory, you could throw any of the characters together in random situations and just have them bounce off and work. People took notice of that, and they loved it. The animation seems to be a little bit cleaner and more high energy than Tiny Toons. Well, less atmospheric, of course, because that's not what it's striving for. Music seems to have a bit of a bigger focus here. Not just in the theme song, although the theme song and Tiny Toons theme song, those are often debated as to which one is better. They now have actual songs instead of just regular segments sometimes. Of course, there's the famous Yakko's World, then there's Wacko's America, the Census Song, A Quake, I'm Mad, and so many more. These were partially because they wanted to give a lot of the composers some stuff to do, and also partially because this show was getting under fire for not having any sort of educational content. So, to appease the networks and their new laws that they passed where networks had to air a certain amount of educational content per day, they had some songs that would actually teach people about things like the aforementioned A Quake and the Census song, as well as the Ballad of Magellan and the President song, and many, many more. See, this is how you make learning fun. Of course, the show wasn't without its snags. Parents drew a lot of ire from a certain series of cartoons. There weren't very many, especially in the first season. They only ended up being two because of the parental backlash. The Minerva Mink cartoons. The Minerva Mink cartoons were already not very well liked because they just focused on one central joke. The title character is attractive and a lot of people have crazy reactions. It's just seven minutes of that, and a lot of people didn't like it, but a lot of parents found it kind of scandalous. Which, if that's the only thing they'd taking notice of, alright then. But the Minerva character was already unpopular, so the creators were more willing to listen to this criticism. So Minerva was cut, only becoming a background character from here on. And then there was also the matter of the aforementioned Bernadette Peters. See, the read and run segments were very, very different from a lot of the others. See, with segments like Pinky and the Brain, Chicken Boo, The Warners, Good Feathers, they're all focused on comedy. Rita and Runt would have comedic moments, but would more be there to tell a story, and of course have some songs sung by Bernadette Peters. But this raised to be a problem. Every episode had to have a song, so the composers were getting really overworked with having to write a lot of songs for Rita to sing. Bernadette Peters was expensive, yes, but the show was high enough budget to where it didn't really bother them. But another thing they took a look at was, it didn't really fit in tone. Now, Reed and Runt weren't removed from the show, unlike Minerva Mink, who was just relegated to background appearances. Their appearances were just reduced, although they did have some focus later on, and especially in the last season where they got put back into the main cast. Another thing to note about this is that the production of the show was very bizarre. See, the network didn't really know how long this whole Tiny Toons is Awesome thing was going to last, so they greenlit Animaniacs for one season at first. A giant season. I'm not exaggerating or joking when I say over half of this show is the first season. And then the second season ended up becoming really short, and then after that they scheduled them for three more actually regular paced seasons. However, there's still that note where it's just the giant first season, so a lot of the flaws they had to iron out later on wouldn't get ironed out until midway through the show. Granted, there weren't very many flaws, but still, that is a fact nonetheless. So then the network came up to the creators again and said, hey, can you make us another one now that Tiny Toons is over? Well, they did go back to work on Tiny Toons for a couple specials, the show was pretty much over. So they felt it best to replace it with something else called Freakazoid. This is about a computer nerd who ends up getting zapped and then becomes some kind of insane maniac superhero. And wacky hijinks ensue. It's basically the tick with the Warner Brothers style of writing. A lot of people took notice of that, and some skipped on it. Maybe it's because Animaniacs was more their priority, or just that they didn't find the premise engaging because at this time, superhero parodies were kind of becoming a dime a dozen. This worried the network, so they decided to push the time slot around. And around, and around, and around, and around. 
When networks do this, it is a very, very clear indication that they have no faith in the show and don't believe that it can stand on its own merit. And Paul Rugg, the head writer of the show, took note of that and said that if it wasn't for the constantly changing time slot, the show would have been a success because if it's going to change time slots every week, it's going to become impossible to find and then ratings are going to suffer. And it wasn't for the content, no. The content had everything that made Animaniacs good, just with a bit more of a story focus, albeit completely weird stories that would often get broken. It was often compared to the Jay Ward style of humor like Rocky and Bullwinkle had, with Animaniacs thrown in. Unfortunately, Freakazoid only ended up lasting two seasons, and only the first one was aired with just bits and pieces of the second aired on the network before it was entirely cut. But don't worry, it all got aired in its entirety on Cartoon Network years later. So Freakazoid was kind of a failure, and the creative staff looked at this, knowing it wasn't their fault, but still thought to themselves, something's up here. The network really isn't understanding us. Things are kind of becoming a problem. However, the network actually did something right and decided to make up for the Freakazoid debacle. They said, hey, why don't you make another show? But we want it to be a spin-off of the most popular characters from Animaniacs which would be the Warners, but that would be like giving Buster and Babs their own show. It's pretty much already their show. So the next most popular were Pinky and the Brain. So after the first season, Pinky and the Brain had, again, a reduced presence on the show. Contrary to popular belief, they went the Rita and Runt route where they just didn't have as many appearances later on. They were still utilized, definitely. Just not nearly as much because, of course, if you had... Pinky and the Brain segments constantly flowing from Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain episodes from the actual Pinky and the Brain series, the writers are going to get burnt out. But it's pretty much what the show was, is just Pinky and the Brain episodes. Sometimes 22 minutes, sometimes the regular length that they had been previously, and unlike the Plucky Duck show, they learned their lesson and made original cartoons for this, not just relying on old ones, which I don't even think they did once. And it was exactly that, just Pinky and the Brain episodes, but longer. And also, if you look, more political as well. There's a lot of jokes about, at the time, President Bill Clinton, or in the 1996 era, Bob Dole. But this show did run into a huge roadblock. Both this and Animaniacs, more so this one, were pressured to add new characters into the main cast so that they could be more marketable and would stay fresh. You know, the Butch Hartman school of let's keep this show going no matter what the fans say. So they made an episode called Pinky and the Brain and Larry, which was basically one giant middle finger to all those executives saying, hey, put in more characters. And it worked for a time, and Pinky and the Brain, and to a lesser extent Animaniacs, were less meddled with, even though Animaniacs had to bend over for a couple things to make the network happy in response. Even so, both Pinky and the Brain and Animaniacs went off without a hitch, going on really, really strong and really, really long. But it was getting to be about the time where Animaniacs was going to call it in. There was a lot of stuff going on for them, and they'd done pretty much all that they could do over the span of the five seasons, and they felt it was time to put it to rest, and the network agreed. The show had run its course and had done its job well. However, they over-agreed to that statement, and they also felt that it applied to Pinky and the Brain. Despite the fact that the creators wished to keep it going as they had infinitely more ideas and possibilities for the characters, they cut it down alongside Animaniacs. While the last episodes were being produced and aired over the course of both shows, the executives were talking about another Pinky and the Brain series which led Tom Ruger and Steven Spielberg to wonder why the show was even cancelled, but then they got their reason. They wanted a show with Pinky and the Brain to have a new character added to the cast, but wouldn't really be a new character, would be one with marquee value, in other words, a character that audiences recognize and can relate to, specifically one from the Tiny Toons Adventures cast. Which, they were somewhat open to the idea, and they were throwing around ideas on who it could be, until the network demanded it would be Elmira Duff, who was, of course, the Tiny Toons equivalent, to Elmer Fudd, where instead of hunting animals, she would love them and squeeze them and hug them to itty bitty bits until they die. See, the problem with this was Elmira was the least popular of the Tiny Toons characters. Even Montana Max, the show's villain, was more popular than her and more liked among fans. 
As Rowdy C from TV Trash pointed out, most audiences at the time didn't even feel sorry for Elmira when Montana Max stood her up in the prom episode, because they just found her annoying and they didn't like the way she treated the other characters. Sounds like a great idea to make a show about her, right? Now, it seems like the network had always secretly liked Elmira more than the actual creators and the fans, because there was a whole Tiny Toons episode dedicated to her, and a lot of people have speculated to this day that it in fact was a backdoor pilot. And especially now that this one came out, eh, the evidence is very clear that that very well could have been. So the show was now Pinky, Elmira, and the Brain, focusing on Pinky and the Brain, having Acme Labs destroyed, are now adopted by Elmira while they're constantly being hunted by Christopher Walken for reasons, and they're trying to take over the world while also avoiding Elmira's terrible treatment. You can see the many, many facets of what went wrong here. The biggest problem that a lot of people had with this was, of course, Elmira. They didn't like the way she treated a lot of the characters, specifically Furball. So how would you like to see a whole show about her treating some of the most beloved characters from that Warner Brothers lineup, Pinking the Brain, even worse than she did a lot of those other animals? I mean, we're used to seeing Brain get the short end of the stick, but this was a bit too much for a lot of people. Another thing that bugged a lot of longtime fans was the lack of continuity between this and all other previous series. Yes, they reference Acme Labs. Yes, they reference some of the previous events in the Pinky and the Brain show. However, a lot of other things like character traits go straight out the window, and the characters do become fairly flanderized, especially Pinky. And Almira's character... While staying the same, her surroundings are entirely different. None of her family is seen from that one-shot episode in Tiny Toons. She doesn't go to Agni University anymore, it's not even mentioned, so we don't know if she dropped out or if she didn't graduate. And the biggest flaw in a lot of people's eyes is that Montana Max isn't there. Maybe it's because Danny Cooksey just wasn't interested, which I don't blame him. But one of her biggest facets to her character was that she was obsessed with Montana Max in a romantic way. And it's that they go and replace him with some generic, vaguely Montana Max-like character. This left a lot of fans upset, especially because towards the end of the show it implied that Montana Max felt the same way. And then Elmira actually got some popularity among shippers, but at least it was popularity nonetheless. And of course, it wasn't just the premise that was manufactured by the network. It was the humor. It was ordered to be safer and tamer and less innuendo-y, so almost all innuendo were removed. Of course, they were still there, but they were now dragged out because the writers seemed to have felt like they really needed a makeup for what they couldn't do anymore. A lot of people were really turned off by this. They didn't like Elmira, they didn't like the writing style, they didn't like anything, and they felt like Tom Ruger and Steven Spielberg had betrayed them, not knowing it was actually the network, even though they put in the theme song now, Pinky and the Brain share a new domain. It's what the network wants. Why bother to complain? The Earth remains a goal. Some things they can't control. The show was an immediate failure. Not even the brief, and I mean brief, first season was aired in its entirety. Only about five episodes were aired before the show was completely canceled. And then the rest were aired in some r random, unrelated variety show. After that... The writer Peter Hastings had left and gone to work for Disney with his last contribution being the episode of the original Pinky and the Brain show, You Will Never Eat Food Pellets in This Town Again, which was a very unsubtle reference to the treatment he had been getting from the network. Spielberg and Ruger never again collaborated with Warner Brothers on an animated series, and the cartoons that would follow the wake of Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, Freakazoid, Pinky and the Brain would all be compared in that spectrum and would greatly suffer. So it just goes to show that the network didn't know what it had till it was all gone for good. But even though we're probably never going to get anything like this again, it's good to know that we at least have this old stuff to go back on. It's good to know that Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, and the like still live on, not just in our hearts, but on DVD and in massive fandoms. Whenever Rob Paulson or Maurice LaMarche go to Comic-Con, they always make it a very poignant point to reenact something Pinky and the Brain related. Rob Paulson especially is always eager to do anything Animaniacs, and they're becoming more popular than ever now, especially with 90s nostalgia being the big thing. 
And of course, Pinky on Myra and the Brain has constantly been ridiculed in these recent days with even the executives admitting it was a very bad idea. But I think it's fine that they stopped when they did. Because had they gone on, they probably would have lost their novelty and their special quality. We would have gotten used to them, and we would have taken them for granted. So I think it's good that they stopped when they did. Huh? What? Animaniacs is getting a reboot? Oh yeah, forgot about that. Join me next week when I talk about why, statistically, that cannot work. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this retrospective. What'd you think of these shows? Did you learn anything new? Comment below, let me know, and I'll see you guys next week. Good night, everybody. Hey, that actually makes sense here.